Good afternoon. How are you this afternoon? I hope you enjoyed your lunch like I did. Um, let us uh, close our eyes as we just say another word of prayer before we begin. Father, please be with us, speak to us. We want to hear you reminding us of this beautiful truth that you've introduced to us as Adventists in the beginning of our movement. Abide with us and guide us in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm very impressed with this community. I think it's one of the most organized I've been in Africa. Attended, it's an incredible experience and a wonderful opportunity to be able to participate in such a, a well-organized event. And what is more particularly interesting to me is not just the organization, it's the theme that was chosen. Salvation Simplified. Um, there are few communities where I can just want to talk about the sanctuary. Uh, it's because the sanctuary doctrine is one of those areas where we want to de-emphasize. Where scholars in the academic world are saying, well, we don't really know if it is there in heaven, the sanctuary issue. So I was asked to talk about prophecy, and it's only relevant for me to address Adventists um, about prophecies in relation to the sanctuary um, that are relevant for our time. Ellen White in the book Evangelism, page 221, says, The correct understanding of the ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. The correct understanding of the sanctuary is what brought Adventists into existence in the first place. That is what we want to study today. Why do we have a Seventh-day Adventist church? What led to the rise of the movement of the Adventist church is the understanding of the sanctuary. So the sanctuary led to the conclusion that something was going to happen in 1844. Then, after that didn't happen, the sanctuary clarified that. And after the sanctuary clarified that, the sanctuary gave us a mission and a purpose for us as Seventh-day Adventists. And this amazing promises about the sanctuary that made us who we are as a church, Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, will be an area that I'm going to focus on throughout this week. So today, I'm going to talk about prophecies in relation to Adventists. Prophecies that, if they were not in the Bible, they would never have been, have been a seventh-day Adventist. So if you turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 10, Revelation chapter 10 is a chapter that is found in a certain section of Revelation. You see the book of Revelation has different parts. You can divide it into two main parts. There's Revelation 1 to 11. You have Revelation chapter 1 to 3, talking about the seven churches. Then Revelation chapter 4 to 7, talking about the seven seals. And then Revelation chapter 8 to 11, talking about the seven trumpets. So when you look at the seven trumpets, you have trumpet 1 to 4 in Revelation chapter 8, trumpet uh, 5 and 6 in Revelation chapter 5, and then you come to Revelation chapter 10, where you are now expecting it to get to the seven trumpet, but it doesn't. It actually pauses before introducing the seven trumpet to introduce a group of people that will play a significant role in the end time. And that is where we see uh, the existence of seven day Adventists prophesied in Scripture. Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head and his face, where was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. So here, the, and John is describing an angel. He says this angel is a mighty angel. And this mighty angel is clothed with a cloud. So his clothes are in cloud, and then the Bible also says he has a rainbow on his head, and it says his feet are like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand, in verse 2, a little book that is open. Uh, he had a book that is open. So... Before we go any further, who is this angel that John is describing here? I believe this angel is Jesus Christ. 
Isn't Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation sometimes associated with clouds? Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 speaks about that. It says, Behold, he cometh with what? With clouds. So clouds are associated with Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ is compared as having feet as pillars of fire. Uh, especially in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus Christ is the one who is described sometimes as a lion that roareth. That is what you see in Revelation chapter 5. So when you compare the identifying marks of this angel, you will discover that it is Jesus. Jesus Christ is the one that is coming here. Why is he called an angel? Well, the word angel that we translate angel in English is from the Greek word angelos, which literally means a messenger. So Jesus Christ is coming with a message and is approaching John with this message. There's the cloud message, the message in the pillars of fire, the message that is coming, and this message is also contained in the little book that he has. And John here represents a group of people that we call Adventists around 1840s. How can we be sure of that? Because Revelation chapter 9, we have the fifth and the sixth trumpet. And we, we heard this morning from Dr. Dupree that the sixth trumpet was sounded in August 11, 1840. Do you remember that? August 11, 1840. So when you get Revelation chapter 9, that is where you are. You are in 1840 in Revelation chapter 9. Then when you jump to Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, you are now in 1844. So, um, and then from 1840 to 1844, that is the contextual setting that we find Revelation chapter 10 embedded. During this time, John sees an angel, Jesus Christ, coming with a message. And this message is dedicated to a group of people that during this time we identify as the Millerite movement. And these people, Jesus Christ is coming to them, and the Bible says he has a little book, and this little book is open. So if Jesus is holding a book, and he has opened this book, and he gives you the book, it means that this book is very, very important, isn't it? It's a very, very important book that Jesus Christ was presenting here to John, who is an example or an illustration of Seventh-day Adventists. And he says to John in Revelation chapter 10, are we there? Revelation chapter 10, and we want to look at verse 8. It says in verse 8, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. I went to the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. So this angel is a little book. We have identified this angel as Jesus Christ. And as Jesus is coming to John, he says to him, You know what? Take the little book and eat it. So John takes the little book. In his mouth, it's nice and sweet. But after he eats it, in his belly, it's very, very bitter. And after that, he's commanded in verse 11. Um, and it says in verse 11, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many people, nations, tongues, and kings. There's an important book or a scroll that Jesus Christ presented to Adventists around 1840s. And he said, You need to take this little book, chew it. It's going to be sweet in your mouth. But in your belly, it's going to be bitter. And after the bitter experience, you must go and prophesy again. So the attention that Jesus is drawing to Adventists or the Millerites is to study the little book. And the Bible says this book is open. And in Bible times, books were not like this ones here like I'm holding a Bible here, it was not like this, it was scrolls. So when they would have a scroll, the scroll will be rolled up and then get sealed. So when you have a scroll that gets sealed, you cannot read the contents of the scroll and you cannot understand what is in it. We find this 
example in Revelation chapter 5 where John sees a book that was sealed with seven seals and, um, and somebody needed to open the seal so that the contents of that scroll could be read and understood. Are we together? My time um, is not on my side, so I'm just assuming you already know this. I'm just recapping basic Adventist teachings that we have on Revelation chapter 10. So now, John here sees a book that is now open before him, and Jesus Christ recommends this book. Question. Do we have any book in the Bible or any portion of the Bible that was once sealed and until the end of time when it will be unsealed? Yes, we do. And turn with me to the book of Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 is such an important chapter for Seventh-day Adventists. And depending on what Dr. Dupree covers, my aim was to cover Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. I usually have um, a 10-part series just on Daniel 8, verse 14 with you this week, and I'm going to just take snapshots from that particular section. Daniel chapter 8. In Daniel chapter 8, just as a brief summary of this, we have Daniel sees a ram. And then he sees a male goat. And then he sees four horns. And then he sees one of these little horns that rises up and it starts treading the sanctuary underfoot. And it starts treading God's people underfoot. And in verse 13 and 4, verse 13, the angel is now talking to another messenger here. And he says, how long are you going to allow this little horn power to trample underfoot the sanctuary and God's people? And the answer given is Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. I'm going to explain some of this throughout this coming week. But what's interesting is that after the vision is given, if you go to Daniel chapter 8, verse 15, verse 15 says, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me the appearance of a man. And I heard a voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. <clears throat> So voice tells Gabriel, Angel Gabriel, you need to make sure that Daniel understands this vision. So Gabriel goes on and he says, okay, the realm that you saw represents the kingdom of Medo-Persia. And he says, okay, that is verse 20 of Daniel chapter 8, verse 21. He says, okay, the goat that you saw represents the kingdom of Greece. And the four horns that you actually saw represents the four kings that will arise out of Greece. And after that, then Daniel speaks about this little horn power and what he does, and he identifies who that is. And then, when he's now about to hear more about this 2300 days, he doesn't get an explanation. If you go to Daniel chapter 8, verse 26, Daniel 8, verse 26, the Bible says, and the vision of the evening and the morning which was told that to you, Daniel, is true. Wherefore, shut up the vision, for it shall be for many days. So he's told, you know what, I can give an interpretation of the ram, the ego, the four horns, and all of that. But that vision about the 2300 days is going to take place way into the future. What I can tell you about the vision is that it is correct. It's a true vision. And then Daniel is now listening. Okay, give me more details about this 2300 days. And he doesn't get the detail. Verse 27 tells us why. And I, Daniel, fainted and was six certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. So Daniel never got to understand. He was just told it's a true vision. Seal it. It's going to be fulfilled in the future. And then Daniel faints. He wants to know more. So he prays in Daniel chapter 9. 
And the angel Gabriel comes to try and explain to him. He explains a portion, not all of it. And in Daniel chapter 12, if you go with me now to Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. In chapter 12, Daniel is told, you need to seal up the vision and seal up the book and shut up the vision. This vision here that the angel is talking about is the same one that we hear about in Daniel chapter 8. In Daniel chapter 12, in chapter 8 it was told, shut it up, it's going to be fulfilled way into the future. And then, then Gabriel comes to try and explain to Daniel what's going on. And Daniel cannot fully quite understand everything. And he's still worried. Yes, I still want to understand that vision. And in chapter 12, towards the end of the book, he's told, you know what, Daniel? Shut up the book. Seal the book. Shut up the vision. It will be fulfilled in the future. And in verse 9, chapter 12, verse 9, it says... And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So Daniel is told, seal it this up. It's going to be fulfilled in the future, in the future time, at the time of the end. This book that is sealed will be opened and people will be able to understand it, read it, understand its meaning. But the kind of people who will understand are those who are pure and tried and made wise. So that is how we end in the book of Daniel. The vision is not clearly given. We are just told that God will give the people in the end of time ability to understand this. What are we saying? What was sealed by Daniel? Was it the whole book of Daniel? No. Did Daniel understand Daniel chapter 1? Yes. 2? Yes. 3? Yes. 4? Yes. 5? Yes. Did he understand Daniel chapter 8? Yes. He understood the ram. He understood the he goat. He understood the four horns. He understood the little horn. What portion in the book of Daniel, didn't Daniel understand? It's Daniel 8 verse 14. That is the portion that needed to be revealed in clearer form in the end of, in the time of the end. Now we come to Revelation chapter 10. When we get Revelation chapter 10, there is an angel who appears. And this angel, as we saw in the beginning of this presentation, is Jesus. Jesus appears as an angel, and he has in his hand a little book. And this little book is not sealed anymore. It's opened. And it's given to this group of people for them to take this little book, chew it, it will be sweet in their mouth, and as they digest the contents of this little book, it will be bitter in the belly. You understand where I'm going with this, right? Jeremiah chapter 16, Jeremiah 15 verse 16, the Bible speaks about this in Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 16. Thy words were found and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. What did Jeremiah eat again? The word of God. And how was it? It was causing joy in his heart. So when John was given the little book, it was an instruction from Jesus Christ. You must study the book of Daniel chapter 8 verse 14. And as you study it, it's going to be sweet. Let me give you a brief history. A farmer called William Miller, <clears throat> a very interesting man who was an experienced farmer who lived way back in the late 17th century and early 18th century, 
Born in 1782 and died in 1849, he was the firstborn of 16 children. He had no money for studying anything, doing any further studies, so he decided to teach himself how to read and how to write. This man was an accomplished man. He ended up becoming a constable, um, a justice of peace in the United States, and a deputy sheriff. He was also a self-proclaimed deist. He finally joined the U.S. military when they were still fighting for independence from the British. And in the War of Independence in 1812, the Americans were outnumbered by the British three to one. And this man was sure they were going to lose the war. And William Miller was surprised that the Americans won in that battle in 1812. After that, as a deist, he believed that God is there, but he does not interfere in human affairs. What he saw in 1812 changed his perception about God. So he decided, you know what, maybe let me give God a chance. Maybe let me give God an opportunity to reveal himself to me. And he went to his Methodist church where he was fellowshipping. And uh, his mother, he had lost his father, and his mother was a widow. So he decided, well, let me accompany mom to church. So he came to church with his mother, and he would sit in the pews. And one time, there was no pastor in the church, so they asked William Miller to come and read a sermon. So he continued reading the sermon Sunday after Sunday, until something that was mentioned in those sermons touched his heart. That's why I like what this church is doing, inviting young people to participate. The word of God is able to pierce the hearts, even of those who do not want to believe the truth. And uh, William Miller heard that and he said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the Bible. So he took a Bible and started reading it from Genesis to Revelation. And he had a concordance. It was called Crudence Concordance. He had a Bible that had marginal reading and he read everything from Genesis, went to Exodus went all the way and reached to Daniel and read Daniel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. When he got to chapter 8, it was interesting. He went through the ram, understood the he goat, then to the four horns and then to the little horn. And when he came to Daniel 8, 14, he got stuck. He stayed there for two years trying to understand what is this cleansing of the sanctuary. So he did a lot of study, and his study led him to the conclusion that, hang on a moment, the sanctuary is planet Earth. He had read certain Psalms that God compares the sanctuary to the Earth, and then he says, you see now, using Hebrew parallelism, the sanctuary is the Earth. So therefore he concluded that, how will the Earth be cleansed? Well, the Earth will be cleansed by fire if you look at different Bible verses. It's clear that when God cleanses the earth, he will use fire. So then he concluded that if the sanctuary is the earth, and the earth has to be cleansed by fire, then, and I understand Daniel 8, 14 to be saying, in 1844, the sanctuary will be cleansed. Obviously, planet earth will be cleansed by fire. And that led him to conclude that Jesus was coming in 1844. So after he reached that conclusion, he was shocked. He said, I can't believe this. And he spent five more years restudying his conclusions, questioning them and re-questioning them and re-questioning them until after five years, he said, okay, that's it. And then he said, God, I'm not brave enough to even go and share this with people. Because after he was done, he heard a voice that told him, go tell it to the world. And he said, no, I can't go. I will not go, Lord, until you come and invite me. And immediately after he said that prayer, there was a knock on his door. A young man knocked on the door and said, Father Miller. Then he said, what, what, what's wrong? Well, um, our pastor is inviting you to share what you have been studying in the Bible with our church. He was stuck frozen. He could not believe what he was hearing. And he said, Lord, you are too much for me. So he started going to those churches and sharing that Jesus was coming 
October 22. Before that, he didn't say October 22. He was talking about April 18 and March 21. Um, 1844, initially they thought it was going to be 1843, and then uh, he was going to the churches teaching that message. It was so sweet because people like Dr. Josiah Leach, the one that uh, uh, Dr. Dupree was talking about earlier on, read William Miller's messages, and he says, wow, this is incredible. And he went and studied the trumpets and discovered that on August 11, 1840, the Ottoman Empire is going to collapse. And after that, he published his findings of Bible prophecy a day before the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. And on August 11, 1840, according to that prophecy, the Ottoman Empire collapsed. And that gave an impetus to the Millerite movement. People are like, what? If Josiah Leach's principles of interpretation are correct, and he uses the same principles of interpretation that Father Miller uses, and he predicted the fall of the Ottoman Empire in 1840, August 11, and it happened, obviously, when William Miller says Jesus is coming in 1844, it's going to happen. So people started coming. And then he also met a gentleman called jo jo Joshua V. Himes. Joshua V. Himes was not so much good in public speaking. He was an excellent in marketing and advertising. So Joshua V. Himes had William Miller, and then he was excited. And he went up and he said, Father Miller, you know what? What you have needs to go to the world. I'm going to make sure of that. And he organized big, big tents that would take the whole of Nairobi Central Church and house them. There were about 10,000 people who would gather. I mean, these were Methodists, Presbyterians, Catholics and Evangelicals, Pentecostals, um, Anglicans, all of them from all different denominations gathering together to hear that Jesus is coming. They were selling their homes, some of them. They were selling their door horses, some of them their cows, preparing for the big event. The little book was sweet in the mouth, but it became bitter. The bitterness began in April 18. 1844, when they, they thought Jesus was surely coming then, and they suffered a disappointment. And then, um, uh, um, then it went to March 21, and they suffered another disappointment, and then they said, well, let's go back and restudy this. Samuel Snow came into the picture and studied Bible prophecies and discovered that the Passover happened exactly on Nisan 14, Type, metatype, antitype on the exact day. So it's going to happen in 1844, but what day in 1844? And he went to the Karai Jews and discovered among the Karai Jews that the Day of Atonement was October 22, 1844. And that is what we call the Seventh Month Movement. So this gentleman now started going out and telling the world, in a few months, Jesus is coming. And people were electrified. They were going out and teaching, and many people waited for Jesus to come. October 22, 1844. October 21, some of them gathered right there on their mountain of ascension. Most of them sold their houses, sold their horses, sold everything they had, because Jesus was coming. We don't need them. October 22, 1844 came, and there was bitterness. A major, major bitterness. It was sweet in the mouth, bitter in the belly. As we have seen, it was the study of the sanctuary that led to a group called Adventists to exist. The study of Daniel 8.14. It was the re-study of the sanctuary that led people to conclude it was going to be October 22, 1844. After the disappointment in 1844, it was so bitter. James White said, I cried and cried and cried. And there were many of our Adventist pioneers who cried. The bitterness was strong. It was painful. It was really, really bad. Then one of the Adventists who had been prominent in teaching this was walking through the fields. Why would you walk through the fields? Well, he was afraid because... The journalists were waiting, you know, after you've made such a prediction and 
No, it's, nothing has been fulfilled. Journalists were waiting to start writing stories. Um, and they were already publishing articles that were saying, we have tried to search on planet Earth and there's not even one spot that has a scorch of fire. They were mocking and ridiculing this idea. So this gentleman starts walking through the fields and the truth that he has studied, he had that light bulb moment. And that light bulb moment led him to go and study the Bible more. And as he studied the Bible more with three other men, he discovered that, uh oh, we were wrong. What happened is that Jesus, the earth is not the sanctuary, there's a sanctuary in heaven. Again, the study of the sanctuary helped us understand why there was a disappointment. The study of the sanctuary led this group of people to group together. The first doctrine they studied after the disappointment of 1844 was the sanctuary. Hiram Hudson was his name. He met a gentleman called O.R.L. Crozier and Dr. Han. The three of them sat together in 1845 and put together an article called the Crozier Article in a, in a magazine called the Daystar Extra. And that magazine was published and Ellen White recommended for the brethren to read that article. And their conclusion was very simple. Oh, 1844 is correct. October 22 is correct. What is wrong is the event. The event is what is wrong. Jesus is not coming to cleanse planet Earth because the sanctuary is not planet Earth. There is a sanctuary in heaven where Jesus Christ ministers for us. That is the one that needs to be cleansed. Again, the understanding of the sanctuary clarified Adventism. It helped us understand the disappointment and explain it. It helped us connect with the Lord and understand his work in the heavenly sanctuary. And after that, we have the Bible conferences in the Adventist church that began, where now other doctrines, other than the sanctuary doctrine, were now studied, state of the dead, the three angels' messages, and the spirit of prophecy, and the system of truth that we have as Adventists was built on a huge foundation of the sanctuary doctrine. We have existed because of the sanctuary. And Bible prophecy predicted that. That our study of the sanctuary in connection with prophecy is going to lead to a disappointment. But after we have come out of the disappointment, the Bible says, thou must prophesy again. You should go now and tell the world what you found in that little book and the reason for that disappointment. And the three angels' messages now are supposed to be taught by us to the world because we have eaten the book. And there's no way you will fully understand the cleansing of the sanctuary unless you have studied the book of Leviticus, unless you have studied the book of Hebrews, unless you have studied all these books that we are neglecting to study in our time. That's why I repeat my words. I am happy that at this camp meeting, we have decided to do that which the Lord said to us we must do. Take the little book and eat it. As you eat it and you digest these difficult prophecies and you masticate it in your mind and in your heart and you digest its meaning to you, and you see the great work of our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, you will know what message needs to be shared with the world. And you will go. And the, then Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, continues the same idea. That you need to measure the temple and the worshipers and the altar. In other words, study the sanctuary. The message from Christ to seven the Adventists is study the sanctuary. Why should we study the sanctuary? Because the plan of redemption is revealed there. How the great controversy is going to be completed is revealed there. How you should prepare yourself for heaven is revealed there. The definition of what is sin, the nature of sin, the nature of righteousness, how you receive righteousness is there revealed. And ultimately, the sanctuary is God's plan 
that he can come and dwell with you. I know I said a lot of things and I said them too fast after people have had a wonderful lunch. But if you forget anything, I want to draw your attention to this as I conclude. Jesus Christ gave us the sanctuary truth and he personally came and gave it to us. He knew that its study is going to lead to a development of a group of people called Seventh-day Adventists. Every time when there was confusion, we went back to the sanctuary and clarified things up. And then we moved on. When there was confusion, we went back to the sanctuary, clarified things up, and then we moved on. And the ultimate teaching of the sanctuary, and let them build me a sanctuary, that I may what? Dwell among them. Men, because of sin, has always been running away from God. Remember in the garden? We ran away from God. And God then said, okay, let them now build me a tent so that I can come and dwell among them because I don't want to be far from them, but my glory is too bright. Let it be covered through a sanctuary. And then Revelation chapter 3, when he's talking to the church of Laodicea, he doesn't want to be in a tent only. He wants to be in this tent. He said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. Even as I overcame and I'm set with my father in his throne. Jesus' message is the same. Adventist, I want to dwell not among you but in you. I want to be inside your heart. I want to be inside your family. But before I go into any family, I want to be in you. And that message of the sanctuary is what we need as Seventh-day Adventists today. Is there anyone who would like to say, Lord Jesus, I want you to come into my heart. I want to open my heart for you to come in and dwell with righteousness so that you may be in me and I in you. If you are there, please show by raising up your hand. Let us close our eyes for a word of prayer. Father, here we come, sinful, fallen as we are. Back to our roots, back to the prophecy that speaks about the sanctuary. And we want to ask you to please cleanse us, purify us, and help us as you cleanse the heavenly sanctuary, that you may cleanse our hearts and our minds. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray, amen.